E vamos ao debate sobre o Estado da Nação. So we're going to talk about the state of the nation of telecommunications in Portugal, basically, with Ana Figueiredo, the CEO of Altis Portugal, uh, Miguel Almeida, CEO of Nossos SGPS, and Mario Varsha, CEO of Vodafone Portugal. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, and thank you very much for uh, coming here uh, to this Congress, which began yesterday, uh, the topics uh, of which we address today uh, during these uh, hours have uh, ad addressed 5G and so we heard the Minister announcing the coverage of the white areas and I would like to begin uh, whereby Anna Figueiredo, the Secretary of State, uh, already um, broached this possibility that by the end of the year there could be this uh, public tender. Uh, does this fact surprise you or not? Good afternoon. Good, uh, good afternoon, Christina. I would like to, to uh, uh, greet my uh, colleagues uh, uh, from the industry and this debate, uh, Maria Miguel. And I would also like to greet uh, Rogério Carapuça and the uh, board of the ADPC, APTC, for this magnificent event. And so allow me a couple of seconds, uh, Christina, because I would also like to give, express my greetings, special greetings to this audience. It's very good for us to be uh, here physically with no masks and no barriers to, uh, to be here live to be able to talk about this uh, um, uh, this industry. This is the first uh, uh, State of the Nation uh, discussion after the pandemic. And uh, uh, we worked in tel telework. We, uh, telework depended on us and uh, companies, uh, depended on us to ensure that their operations continued. So we're here, here the three operators together and we were indispensable for the country not to stop and they have made a very important commitment with the country to ensure that the country did not stop but allow me uh, to say uh, that uh, I would like to ask for a round of applause for the professionals of this sector and uh, we should be congratulated and sometimes we are not fully uh, rec rec acknowledged. Mas o ministro, mas o ministro das infraestruturas. But the Minister of Infrastructures has just said that taking into account that the uh, private are not going to cover the white areas, the government is going to invest in these areas. Uh, well, we have to put things into perspective. If you look at the indicators of the coverage of a mobile and fixed uh, uh, rate, we have uh, a coverage of 99.7% in terms of 4G. We were the first uh, European country to launch 4G, but the, the fabric, uh, a fiber net, uh, net network, or optic fiber network, we have uh, 85%. Percent. There's 15 percent that are out, and so all the we can we can be left out. And so from now, I really appreciate the ministers were saying that it is also up to the public sector and public actors to uh, create the conditions to for us to invest in these areas and leave nobody behind. Is that recognition too? I believe. I think we're all ready to find. Uh, uh, solutions like the solution that we, uh, the three of us, implemented in collaboration with EDP, because we need electric energy for uh, our uh, coverage in the terms of the uh, National Park of Ben uh, With the uh, national entities, we made a joint effort and to cover uh, what is known as the uh, 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 white area uh, after there was a death. And so we're going to talk about these uh, questions. But uh, if you allow me. I would also like to ask Anna, taking into account that you uh, arrived uh, in Portugal some time ago, it's the first time that you are, are intervening in public in a panel, and so so you've been uh, in, for a month leading Altis after working abroad. So, what did you find in the sector in Portugal after 
what you had left when the set uh, was uh, being highly praised in Portuguese in Portugal. Were you surprised? It surprised me before because I was in the Dominican Republic, as you know, it's a developing country, and I managed to conclude and uh, the 5G um, license. So I started a year later and I um, finished three months before and I think that shows how the process went. And so at 20 years I've been working in the sector and so I've been through many transformations in the sector. That is, I remember the launch and the, the launch of the first prepaid MIMO and in the launch of the TV cable TV and the first uh, uh, cable network in, in Portugal. I have worked in spin-offs uh, and uh, once again started in the launch of mill. And so the sector has gone through many transformations over time, but I think that it continues to be a very lively sector. The 20 years of various transformations and back to Portugal after five years and obviously uh, with a great ambition to head the greatest group of telecommunications in Portugal, uh, the high performance of Altis Portugal. And so the, that, that is to, I want to challenge the status quo because we've been leaders for 22 years since privatization and we want to continue to be for another 20 years. That is our ambition. So we have the main competitors that are not going to, so just like, uh, sit back. Um, uh, so uh, how, do you re how do you react to the words of the Minister of uh, Infrastructures? Uh, hello, Chris. Uh, hello, Christina. Hello, everybody. Uh, I would also like to say that uh, for me it's also great uh, a great pride to belong to this sector, and so the, the as we all know, the sector is so uh, important for Portugal. I would like to welcome, but I didn't see any uh, some preliminary messages. I saw a statement on the question of the white areas and uh, and the importance of the sector and the importance of the uh, data of the digital world and uh, what we can and, the, and, and the, the advantage that we can take from uh, underwater cables and so it is very important for the autonomous uh, um, regions and so of course it's not uh, we, could, we couldn't leave them out. In relation to the uh, issue of the white areas, Anna has already mentioned, we uh, work very well with the rest uh, of Europe and globally, and the OECD data shows that uh, it shows uh, exactly the new generation networks and the way of lost business. Uh, uh, but now if you look at connectivity and the reason it's 5G because we didn't have 5G up our score was zero and so in terms of we lost the leadership and uh, we were overtaken by the European average but we cannot take the um, Y areas as a distraction because if we were think high, of high speed connectivity we cannot uh, be uh, happy with the KPI of coverage. No, we can't leave anybody lagging behind. Nobody deserves this. And so uh, in the digital world, we can't have what we had in the analog world. We had many areas and parts of the population that didn't, they didn't have the condition for their own, a personal and economic uh, development. And so we all subscribe to this. But more important than this is what are we going to do with technology? Now, in these same indicators, that even though we have the connectivity that we have, the quality that has been proven through COVID, and the professionals they have for the Portuguese company are those that take less advantage of conductivity in the component, the component of social networks and in some interaction for personal data we uh, compare very badly with the rest of Europe. If the main has got to do with illiteracy, that's the main reason uh, that Portuguese don't use the internet and companies uh, 
Yes, I mean, we have many PMEs where the quality of the resources and the investment capacity and the coverage is uh, our main focus on so. And the PRR, we should have taken this into account, so even though it's one of the pillars of digitalization and digital inclusion. See, in the education, PRR doesn't use them. PRR is not exclusively Portuguese. No, all, Port all European countries are using PRR uh, to recover the economy. In Spain, uh, the, the PRR uh, uh, allotted 3 billion euros to PMS to digital, for digitalization. They created a p package of uh, digital services, which is about um, for, uh, 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 for digital. 12 for digital t tools for cloud e-commerce. Um, cooperative work and companies. So the three billion are being assigned uh, allotted directly to uh, SMS, which is the a fabric of uh, the greatest responsibility for the economy and employment in our European economies. And uh, Portugal was 150 million, even though we're much smaller uh, than Spain. You can see that the difference is uh, great. And so the digitalization component is much uh, much less than this amount. And so this is like giving ca cars to those who cannot uh, um, take out their driving license. And so the structures say that is, they, they want to put an end to these different cleavages, digital cleavages that exist in the country. What, is this semantics or rhetoric, rhetoric? No, there's a priority. The priority we have to have has been to the point of view of the company that you use telecommunication services and you use the digital services. And there we have to put the investment and we'll take advantage of the services. So in relation to your operator, what do you think? Do you agree with what the minister said? Well, first of all, good afternoon to one and all. Thank you very much to, uh, for the info, uh, invitation and some uh, special greetings to Anna, who's uh, here for the first time. I didn't say any criticism by the minister of the sector, the white areas. Everything has already been said about the coverage of uh, uh, high debit to networks in Portugal is 92. Uh, there are other net uh, networks uh, besides Altis, and so this was said today in the report published by Anacom. We are talking about 8% that are not covered by private investments. That means that Portugal is in the second or third uh, country in Europe. Only Sweden and Spain has got uh, uh, higher coverage, and no total coverage that exists in Europe. And I, as a citizen, I agree with this. Uh, it should be uh, guaranteed by public investment. So the, minister, the words by the minister are no surprise. And it comes from the previous uh, uh, mandate. And so those who are going to make this commitment to investment, uh, regardless of the, the retail operators, we don't want to... We don't have a repetition of errors in the past, and so once these objectives have been uh, complied with, the coverage of the white areas uh, seems to be a very praiseworthy initiative. Uh, there is a pity that there are no public uh, investments uh, in Spain, and uh, there are millions invested in fiber and 5G, and in Portugal for five years. Z for 5G and for fiber, zero. And so for a government who wants an universal access to high debit uh, networks, then there must be public investments. So you was talking the lack of acknowledgement of recognition of the, the operators. Do you agree? Well, yes, there's an element, even there's not the sector, has a role to play in the sector and doesn't recognize the sector, but denigrates the sector. We are in second and third 
place in all global rankings in terms of availability of high debit networks, the, uh, the penetration of mobile services, coverage of uh, mobile services in the second and third of prices, but on the other way around, uh, France and six and and, and Fix and uh, Romania and Mobile have cheaper prices than in Portugal. And um, um, so, um, we've been up in the top for five uh, for 30 years, but uh, we're going to now we have uh, problems with this 5G. And so. Uh, I will leave you with another number. I know the f uh, information nowadays is based on what is once said. So, uh, per capita revenue of telecommunications is the lowest one, uh, the lowest in Europe only. In Greece, is it lower? So, regardless of the indicator that we can ch we choose, the competition to and competitiveness and leadership of the sector in Europe and in the world is, is in. but in Portugal it's almost 13 billion euros in Portugal, which is remarkable. So in 5G we're lagging behind everybody else. So in this uh, time, uh, can we make up for lost time? And if we can, how? Well, I think that all of us here and the sector is going to work to make up for uh, lost time. What did the country lose? The country lost, and uh, if we can play with 4G, we were one of the first countries uh, launching 4G, and we were probably the last uh, uh, launching. 5G, and so in this underdeveloped country in Latin America, uh, they had the, uh, the they launched 5Gs before, and I think that yesterday a number of speakers uh, talked about the fact that uh, we uh, couldn't be the first to launch and to uh, capture investment in the use of 5G and 5G technologies. So instead of starting in Portugal, they're going to start in other geographies, and so we're losing uh, the investment foreign investment capacity and investing in our markets. So now I would like to look at a topic uh, uh, that Miguel mentioned and to say uh, that the sector in recent years now uh, economic and financial models have changed significantly where the, uh, the volume of traffic on our network has increased exponentially, and 70% is uh, referred to. 70% is referred to video streaming platforms, gaming, OTTs, big tap, which see their uh, growth from the, the point of view of profitability. Yeah, it makes up for the decrease of profitability in our sector. So uh, we. Uh, have a continuous investment in modernization. So and that is why it's interesting, for example, when we are asked to cover these, <coughs> the, these white areas with profitability, is obviously less. We are a sector, if you look at the last 10 years, in European terms, not only in Portugal, and we lost uh, the profitability. Uh, and they place our, in some place our in 28 among 33 industries. There is a loss. And going back to 5G, it's a pity that uh, one of the conditions in the tender for 5G was to promote the entry of new operators to the market. I think none of us here has uh, any competition, but to bring more operators to the markets in privileged conditions compared to, to those who have been for 30 or years uh, in the market investing in, in, on infrastructures, I think it's going to bring a, a huge imbalance between the newcomers and the existing ones. This is going to penalize our capacity to invest. I think that many European operators uh, are not doing well in this respect. And in Spain, there was an interview, I think, uh, in a Spanish newspaper. 
about mass mobile that is uh, working as no to recognize that they had to consolidate with orange in order to be able to continue to invest in capacity in their networks. So something has to be done in this uh, area because obviously we do not wish to miss the 5G wagon. Uh, we've always been on the forefront and we want to be on the forefront as an industry and as a country in an, such an important thing that is uh, crucial for the uh, digital transformation and for our economy that needs uh, 5G to become internationalized. Let's see if I understood well. Uh, uh, with the investment that you say that you are making, the figures are there, <coughs> but you're not going to compete for the white areas, are you? As you said, it's public investment. We shall open the tender and let's see. So a priori will not bid. Uh, but notwithstanding all these issues with all this investment, to what extent uh, do OTTs and uh, other operators, private operators, are uh, questioning their own mm, investments? Are there other initiatives? This is an issue that uh, does not pertain to Portugal. It's cross-cutting to uh, all of Europe, and Europe is looking at this uh, recent studies say that uh, for mobile or fixed lines, the broadband uh, will vary, and we could say that more than 40 euros per annum of our cost per client will be spent in the transition of the data associated to guarantee these new suppliers. I'm speaking about Meta, Facebook, and all that jazz. Google, Microsoft, the large players who are not European and who are making the most of the investment and developments that we are making in our own networks to the benefit of these large companies. Of course, they are dynamizers of the communication sectors, but if we look at the evolution of the revenues of European uh, operators against the investment and the return on such investment, our industry compared to the uh, rest is the one with, with the lowest ROI. So if this were to go to the stock exchange, people would not invest in telecoms because they will not see a proper return on such investment. And we continue to invest in Portugal more than 20% of our earnings systematically, and we do been doing so for 10 to 15 years. So the obligations that we have from uh, the viewpoint of 5G shall uh, remain or even worsen because uh, we see our investments penalized. There are materials that we need. But there are scarce resources and uh, issues of logistics. There are things that are going to benefit third parties that are not even uh, major players. There are other blocks, uh, for instance. We're talking about three major operators for the whole market. There are more than 100 in Europe. The average of uh, mobile users is uh, 4 million clients, but it's practically 100, 100 million in the US and almost 400 in China, 400 million. With such a level of effort that we have to make in investment, the, if, we, if there are more than 100 operators, then the return on investment will be too uh, low. That's why we're still delayed in 5G in Portugal. That's what you said before. It was uh, connected to the tender. But as you know, we have to be in Europe as we are in Portugal. In Portugal, we're now uh, seeing how someone had uh, 5G before us. And the issue is being copied in uh, the US and China, and Google is also involved because the associated risk to investment uh, is uh, due to the challenge. There are risks that things may fail, but of course uh, that we need financial availability. So we learn from others' mistakes, uh, despite being delayed. 
Yes, but there's a delay in these elements, but there's a capacity to catch capture new investment, but you need to have a return on it. And the problem in Europe is a low level of return on investment compared to the operators that we compete with in US or China. This is a key factor, and one of the elements that affects our profitability has to do with the cost that we have to bear in our investments to the benefit of third parties. Regarding the delay in 5G, what is Portugal going to lose? What we lost, the time we've lost and wasted is not going to be recovered. But still, uh, the way these things happened, uh, well, but better not say much about that. As you referred, uh, well, I belong to what I belong, and I've always been used uh, that we are the ones to have to explain others what they have to do, because we were pioneers in Portugal, but no longer. And others are benefiting from what we do. The mistakes have been made, but we're not used to it. So it was Portugal seen as the leader in telecom sector, thanks to the quality of its human resources and the level of public competitiveness that we have to be innovative every day, looking for, yes, but we still have the infrastructures. Yes, but we have to build others. Into infrastructures there, but for 5G, and in the business sector, we need to make the most of the differentiator elements. We have to start uh, making the most of technology, and we're going to waste another year. We could have done this. This is an added impact, and I'm sorry for extending myself so long. Don't worry, we have time. We've also lost something else. If we had started to develop 5G a year and a half earlier, we would be f much more advanced and with less cost. This is the message I have to leave here. It's a risk for the country. One of the elements to differentiate us from others and for the new ones is that uh, we were given fixed data regardless of the terms of the tender. But uh, the coverage ends in 2025 with totally different prices that we have today. And we don't, we didn't have the problems that we had then, but we have them now. And this is a warning. If, the, if we don't do something about it, we're not going to meet the goal. And we shall speak about the impact, especially the changes, uh, economic and financial changes that we are uh, confronted with. And now, Miguel, you spoke about the third parties, about Netflix and other platforms. One could say that uh, the f why does this happen? Why are you investing? A lot of people who are uh, attending this debate in order for them to understand why these things happen. So my question is, why are the investors investing? And why is there a, some sort of a different legislation for other companies that then become attached to these and not pay for it? What's the benefit for us or for them? Well, we have to do it because there are laws and regulations. That's the net neutrality, which is uh, in. It has good intentions, but has these side effects that are very detrimental. So, about 50% of the traffic on our networks has origin in three companies that are named Netflix, Google, and Facebook. Not in this order, the uh, opposite. And what they pay to use our infrastructure is nil. And it's even worse because we are totally neutral. We are sitting here. We pay almost 100 million euros per annum in regulatory fees. I'm talking about the taxes all the companies are paying. Yes, all sorts of taxes. And uh, it's not normal. Last year was less, but it's not normal that it's 100 million euros in the last 10 years. Between 2011 and 2021, it was 2 billion in regulatory taxes, and these companies are not paying a penny. I don't have the exact figures, 
but these companies may have a turnover in one day that we do not have in one full year, not to speak about profitability compared to uh, how do you justify this discrimination? Well, there is no justification because it has to do with the legislative inertia, not at the Portuguese level. It's not criticism to the Portuguese government. It's a, a cross-cutting problem in Europe. I think that there is uh, some sort of availability to try to uh, change this situation. The commissioner has said that they're going to do something about it because this is uh, unacceptable. And let's hope they do something for heaven's sake, because the cost for us without any profit is significant. But I'd like to go back to the 5G topic, since you speak so much about it. Either Mario and Anna are speaking about the delays, but I confess that I'm concerned, a little concerned by the delay, because we know there's someone responsible, we know who it is, it's happened already. I'm more concerned about the structural uh, elements of the incentives to investment, because uh, in all countries, the way in which the uh, spectre was uh, allocated was because the investment was going to support return. But as a strategic uh, perspective, the governments were trying to guarantee sustainable investment in 5G. And, uh, and the state did the opposite. They created the um, worst mechanism to disincentive investment with with an absurd uh, rule that we considered uh, illegal, and we're, we've taken this to court, because this is to the benefit of other private uh, entities that are not investing. I think it's a structural uh, issue associated with 5G that is more dangerous than one or two years of delay, because that can be eventually recovered. There are costs, but it can be recovered. What is not recoverable is if in a, uh, if in a constant way, if we have a disincentive to invest in 5G because of these rules that were created in, during the tang tender, and we're going to not only lose out because of the delay, and who's responsible? Do you want to give us names? I don't want to put the blame on anyone. I don't want to waste time in this discussion to see who's, do, who's done what and why. I think it's uh, agreed, we all know. We have an incompetent regulator that is not uh, respecting reality. They have, uh, I mean, in, in my opinion, this is detrimental to Portugal's economy and to the social common good. Because the operators can adapt. The operators will continue to create value. Not much, but they will create value for the stakeholders, for the customers, for the uh, shareholders. But who's going to foot the bill of not having the conditions to invest in, in technology and a successful uh, transition is going to be the country. Because in 10 to 15 years' time, the social and economic development of the country is going to be connected to the success in uh, the digital transition. If there are no conditions for investment to create a dynamic, innovative uh, ecosystem, it's going to be difficult for us to lead the digital world in five or years' time. And therefore, uh, there's someone, someone who's responsible for this. So, uh, the responsibilities are imputed to you. So there was a kind of um, exchange of com compliments. And so basically there are six operators uh, who uh, were kept the network, who were left with the network. And so uh, the, uh, the prices with the greatest competition are, are going to uh, drop. Do you agree? I think there are a lot of studies that are prices are uh, very competitive. And so I think that this uh, sector has uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, competition this year by the third country in Europe uh, uh, with uh, uh, with greater movements between operators. So uh, the clients are not happy if they don't have a happy quality uh, service. Obviously, they're going to change Altis or Mail for another operator, uh, market operator. 
sometime in September, for example, if you're asking me 5G, we're going to leave the network open for clients to use this network and to uh, and take use of the uh, facilities that uh, 5G has. And so I don't see why, uh, I don't see how our prices are going to drop because of this. I think that we have, uh, uh, we've been very open and transparent by saying that our sector uh, suffers from profitability. This profitability is decreasing. And I remember that 10, 15 years ago, if you asked me, uh, if you asked me 15, seven years ago when our capex of volume was about 12, 15 percent, I think it is about 20 percent because of the pressure that we have been putting on the growth of this capex to to support our network. And so this investment and coverage and all these commitments that the regulatory commits we have to comply with and our revenues have not uh, grown subs substantially. And uh, I can give you other examples. So outside Portugal, I remember the same CEO of the Maes Marvel said that the sector in Spain lost 35% of revenue over 10 years. And so if we add our revenues to the whole sector and we compare this 10 years ago, there's been no growth. And so I don't think there's margin to increase. Uh, Mario said that the, we are going to have more costs because we're late um, in terms of the rollouts of the networks. We're losing talent every day in these areas and the whole um, delay in the beginning. Uh, but uh, there's a strong pressure for us to globally to be able to comply with the deadlines and posts. So, well, our t our, my team and all teams are going to uh, do their best uh, to comply with these um, deadlines. So there may be a greater increment uh, in terms of the investment. We're going to have to speed up. We have an idea of the investment that's going to be done. But as you must understand, the number is confidential. So, Vodafone, have you got any idea of the investment uh, uh, that's going to be made? Well, it would be, it would be terrible if I didn't know. But just uh, uh, Anna, yes, I subscribe to what she said. Um, but uh, it's just very. So, we're going to uh, disclose uh, accounts next week, number of figures next week. So, so. So I can just say this on uh, uh, 65 million euros. Spent 65 million euros on our acquisition. But this idea of five, five, six operators, many of them are separate. In America, there are three operators, and um, in China, three, and so in Europe, uh, they don't want any with more than four. Uh, there are bigger uh, uh, countries that have got four, but they consolidate. Uh, for example, in Spain, as I've seen from an economic point of view, it's eight times bigger than us and than ours. And so, once again, we're here with the, we're, with the pop populism. That is, the more the, the greater number of operators there are and the competition. Uh, exists and so the price has come down, but this shows a great ignorance on the how the economy works because it showed in practical terms. And doctrine also helps. Uh, I don't want to be theoretical, but it's been shown by global practice that in the minimum number of operators, not to guarantee a competition, but there's a maximum number of operators to guarantee sustainability and sustainable investment. So after this number, and this number is well defined, as we've seen this in all civilized countries, it's a three, but bigger than this number, investments suffer, and the return on investment suffers too, which means that uh, they end up by charging more to the uh, client. So this is a total fallacy. So, uh, the, talking about the cost that the regulator was talking about, the prices, the prices are not going to drop. The prices, as I said a while ago, and I think... I know that there's an increase, there's inflation rate to 7.2% in April. Is it possible for prices in Portugal to drop? Taking it into account, just let me say that in recent last 10 years, the prices have dropped 10%, the number of services and increase over the years. 
of the, uh, uh, so, so we mustn't forget that within the services there's a broad, fixed broadband. Costs have been increased 20, 30 times, and so uh, the pr prices have dropped dramatic, increased dramatically. In a Anacom published, Anacom said that the prices have dropped in 2021. This is the reality. I don't believe that in the inflation context that we're going to talk about, uh, uh, I don't see how any context of inflation, inflation uh, prices are going to um, be decreased and uh, are going to fall in nominal terms. In real terms, I can't sell so prices at a company less than inflation. I think they will increase. Uh, so I'm going to be, if we, uh, if you could just to be a little bit briefer in your answers as we can cover more topics. A lot of people haven't understood the benefits that 5G may bring, beginning with you, Anna, the potential that what we're going to gain in, in the number of sectors, health, um, education, industry. I can give you an example. Uh, last of Thursday, there was an operation on uh, the breast cancer through 5G in partnership with Altis, uh, Portugal Altis Labs, uh, Pontesan, uh, Movistar and Jean-Paul Champalimau Foundation. It was possible that to uh, provide uh, two doctors who, who were 900 kilometers uh, away from each other, they could um, do, carry out their surgery with the most experienced doctor was uh, remote and uh, uh, guiding the doctor who was physically uh, doing the surgery here in Lisbon. I think that this is a specific example of the speed, so the latency uh, of this new technology that can help us improve people's lives. Because at the end of the day, I think that the technology only has a value if it improves the quality of people's lives and the quality of the companies and the communities and the states and their well-being. This is a very concrete example, but I think that uh, 5G is also going to change the way we uh, our, our, change our relationship with technology, and so in May we, we have, uh, I think the chairman says, uh, humanize yourself, and because the technology must be humanized, because it does not, it doesn't make sense. So this new way of transform, of transformation, the latency of five G technology can adjust to people in real time. And so probably we're in the area of the increased enhanced humanity. Well, it's in a positively that that's at least what I have. Well, the examples have already been given in the area of health. And so the first the capacity could have a lot more of uh, equipment of all. And so what is possible to do uh, uh, to distance? And in various countries we've uh, done uh, this, not in that area, but in others, and some logistics uh, yeah, we're through um, remote farm 4.0. There's lots of examples, so we have to take into consideration that we need an ecosystem. Uh, once again, it doesn't uh, only live from the existence of networks or an ent living entity. We are talking about research because we are in the face of tests and experimentation, and I'm talking about many micro companies in the technological sector. So this is a collaboration. This is a new ecosystem that all together we are going to have an openness for and the financial availability for, and we're going to take the risk to do this because it's, it's the five G is going to be a success, and. So, to, to help to benefit humanity and our health, etc. But uh, the whole ecosystem has to speed up, 
and we must be able to work together. And so uh, that's what we're doing, Miguel. And uh, the several studies uh, point to what the impact on the Portuguese uh, impact of 17 million euros. I'm not a microeconomist. If 5G is going to help the way we uh, we, we sell, distribute uh, the way we appreciate moments of leisure, and it's uh, going to affect many uh, business models. I can give uh, concrete examples of cases already launched by Norris in the port of Le Chouche, where we have uh, for, for, for drones based on 5G uh, technology increasing the security of the port. We uh, made in the school of uh, Matosinhos made a virtual visit. As pupils were in the school in Matosinhos, we visited uh, vi Lisbon virtually. And so the, the, what we have to do is create a uh, dynamic innovation ecosystem and attract Portuguese companies to this uh, uh, innovation ecosystem, I mean, for which we need investment. So you talk about the lack of incentives to investment. I mean, you you, you would think the, the the way you talk, people would think that it's better to close your doors, and uh, that the sector is not profitable. Well, some people do. I don't know if you've heard the opportunity of Paulo Bertos as the president of the Congress, and uh, he made a comparison with the investment made in different countries and different continents and technological areas. And he talked about the fact that Europe uh, was sort of lagging behind from the Northern Scandinavians, uh, but in this area. And so, uh, that is the too much regulation, and up to what extent does this end up by? Uh, getting companies to not to invest or to be afraid to invest. And so that is to. So, so I think we've already talked about return on investment and the pressure that we feel. I understand that I don't have this passion as my colleagues do in terms of the regulator, but uh, I'm probably going to feel this soon. I, uh, fortunately, contrary to them, was not here. I, uh, Europe has uh, uh, targets of connectivity until 2030, and all the operators, I think, that you have to invest 50, 500 billion euros in the next uh, seven or eight years uh, to meet these targets. and so. Uh, the uh, sector is being less profitable. Where are we going to attract investors to invest in the construction of these infrastructures that we all recognize that they are all important in the European space and the Portuguese space? So uh, that is my question. I don't know what else I can say on the topic of uh, profitability <laughs> of the sector. And I think that this is, I think that we're in a critical time. We're going to create a critical context for the sector, and I don't know whether there's too much regulation. I think in some areas we do have too much regulation, but I'd like to put the topic in there. What we need are regulators to act in the 21st century with tools of the 20th century and not with uh, uh, tools from the past century. We cannot have regulators that are going to in prevent us and the sector from growing and uh, economies from prospering and uh, from growing and developing in a sustainable way. I think that's the important thing. Is it a question? <laughs> the problem is the kind of regulation. And uh, Miguel, a while ago, has 30 years of experience of this. So the regulation we've seen in the last 30 years is not, is not very practical when they started in the 1990s. And it's all about price. And this has been in Portugal in the last few years, but also in Europe. The concern, which is a valid concern, of course, as Miguel and Anna have defined this, 
there's a minimum number of operators to guarantee competition. They say so, and you know well enough that when we uh, compete to gain a customer and uh, to retain the customer, this can only be done with price. The price is perhaps the easiest uh, uh, tool for competitiveness. How do we differentiate in service quality? How can we go ahead to have the best uh, technology to provide the best uh, service? We need to invest uh, and be visible. Th these are values, these are things that I'm not going to repeat because Miguel already announced them. It's about our plans. We're always uh, ideally on the 13th of uh, May to go to Fatima, not to find surprises the following year, because it can be suddenly new needs, and they start with new taxes, and so we pay up front hundreds of millions and a lot of taxes. If there are any unexpected issues, but if the key elements of regulation are not taken into account, which is the profitability of the sector, and uh, as you say, it's critical for the European space to be able to compete. And from this viewpoint, European regulation in the past has not proven to be open. They've always tried to avoid uh, consolidation because they saw consolidation as a negative thing for consumers, when in reality, the fact proves the opposite. So at the European level, the trend is the opposite. Nowadays in Europe, uh, things are more open, and practice proves this. There is consolidation in Spain, not only with regulation, and Portugal has done the exact opposite, going, going back to the 1990s, when we have uh, needs for the 21st century. So we have to invest. Uh, we're going to have to invest as soon as we know that others, without needing to invest, we're going to make the most of our networks and nev browsing for 10 years and uh, making a profit out of our own investment. This is, of course, uh, not right. So there's an, an imbalance that is the wrong way to see things because uh, the profitability for the industry is critical for uh, the development of the country and the economy and populations in general, and this uh, view that is not c catered for in regulation, at least in Portugal, at least in Europe, it, it is uh, progressing slightly in Portugal. We've gone back several years in this respect. About regulation, I think a lot has been said. It's uh, quite clear from your comments. But uh, with the risk of seeming backward, the truth is that uh, today the sector, the return on investment is below the capital costs. We have to be clear about that. And the investment that is uh, going to be made in this uh, respect for 5G are not going to con con contribute to in invert this situation. And as Mario said, uh, things are getting worse. And in turn, mm, capital will invest elsewhere. So that's the, the truth, that, the facts. Uh, uh, investment is below capital costs. I would like to add something. I would like you to add something that we've mentioned uh, already. The topic of uh, our discussion is the state of the nation of communications. Do you agree with the this title. Do you think there is such a thing as a state of the nation for communications? I believe that there is a state, there is a context for the sector. I'm not sure uh, that uh, you're maybe playing with the words in your question. I'm asking that straightforward about regulation. I think that any time the market ha is less regulated in some matters, we have proven to be able to bring investment. We have invested in infrastructures. We have managed to work in providing quality to the service and uh, get, provide a better service to our customers. I agree with the panel members. It's very important for any investor to have uh, predictability in regulation and uh, specific uh, regulations uh, and uh, proper tax uh, taxing. We've been discussing that we have been uh, thinking about long-term investments, so we invest on technologies to last uh, many years. We're not changing things uh, from one day to the next, and uh, 
This is not a recurring thing. That's why we need uh, foreseeability, predictability. We need to know how much investment is going to be made. And we've worked uh, to mitigate the effects. There are some factors uh, that make uh, companies more resilient. Obviously, we've made some very difficult decisions in the last few years to optimize operations to be more resilient. And we may have the capacity to continue to invest in what's most important for us, which is the capacity of our network of infrastructures, the quality of services, and to be close to our customers and provide them the best service. We don't want to compete with price. I think we all need to compete with service quality and innovation. This is our mindset <coughs> in Altice, uh, and it's uh, this is a conviction that uh, makes us work on a daily basis. And I don't know whether we can speak about the state of the nation. We have to have a better state because the state is obviously an essential stakeholder to accelerate or decelerate. I think. We all have to collaborate, especially after the pandemic. We have to accelerate the economic recovery. We have to accelerate our uh, economy and bring Portugal back to a situation of growth. Portugal has had a very anemic growth in its GDP. It's a country that has grown 6 to 7% in its GDP in the last 15 years. It was one of the countries with the greatest uh, growth from the viewpoint of uh, of the economy. But we have uh, ambitions, but we ha also have the, to have the courage and many things, of course, are going to depend on the state and on the political actors. We need to, to have the courage to change that which has structurally prevented us from being greater and better and to grow sustainably. I think that Portugal and the Portuguese have everything from the viewpoint of assets, but we need the help of the state to speed this up. Yes, these are the traditional statements in our kind of panels. And for instance, uh, although I may uh, diverge from the discussion. We've already spoken about the challenges of profitability and we have to continue to challenge our stakeholders and make them trust in what we're doing in order to guarantee that their investments have some return and to make them be optimistic as to things that will improve. And so will we all But we are, uh, as a group, a sector that must know what we're doing for the country. The pandemic has proven how important this is. And uh, despite uh, what has been discussed, well, there are many colleagues who come to Portugal. And now we have many meetings in Lisbon, maybe out of coincidence. But it's uh, giving publicity to what we're learning to do. There are many areas in which we can improve because we must do it. But we have to uh, do our best to make it there. We have to overcome all the stumbling blocks and be a, a simple example so people understand what we do and what we are. And pr try to avoid confusion there are some minor issues, which is speaking about big things. And whenever a customer has a difficulty to access the fixed network at home, and we know that this happens, if this is because of a, a breakdown outside of the home or in a public thoroughfare, there are some uh, people that say that they need 10 days to obtain the authorizations. And this is a lot of time. Can, we, we cannot uh, have our customers without service for 10 days. So if something needs to be repaired, we cannot uh, wait, uh, wait so long for that. And yet this is the situation that we face day after day. And the customers are going to blame the company. And uh, quite frankly, just to fix a, a cable that is broken, there should be so much uh, red tape and bureaucracy. 
but of course there are other implications as to the aerial uh, rights of passage uh, or easements and uh, these are things that make things so difficult and sometimes we have the uh, the aerial easement the owner of the infrastructures will have areas that are not white but they have a they'll have a very strange color and our customers will be without a service which is out of the question absolutely so uh, decisions decisions yes i know decisions decisions are difficult to make and we agree uh, to what you are saying anna is was told that, uh, that Vodafone was going to receive a certain funding and I'm waiting to get the money that I have paid extra. But of course there's the public consultation period and who's right, who's wrong, nothing happens in the end and we're still waiting. And with 4G, remember 4G, it exists uh, in Portuguese legislation since the 1990s. We had to adapt the frequencies in 2014, and we spent a fortune, although the turnover is great, but the mo money is money after all. And so today we see that it was established that we had the right to be reimbursed for our costs, but we haven't been, we haven't seen a penny yet. So if you have to pay a, a 20 euro uh, invoice, uh, and, and I'm still waiting for this money that I'm that we've been owed since 2017, it's a public consultation, and the money was meant to be paid in 2018, and still the money has not been paid. So 5G will have to take into account these things. It's, these are just examples of things that are not being done properly. And if we speak about the large issues, there are minor issues that have a large impact and we should prevent them from happening. And uh, the devil is in the details, so we have to take this uh, very seriously into account. And the government must know what to do to accelerate the digitalization of the countries. There's a huge wish list in the in the buckets, but we'll have to try to sort this out soon or else we're going to be in a spot of trouble. <laughs> yes, so what is necessary to uh, accelerate the digitalization of the country? Well, uh, I thought we were here to speak about the state of the nation. Well, there may be some people out there who have a better reply than I have, with more knowledge. But how can I explain in five seconds? Well, there are many people here. Others are not present. But we have to be proud about communications, because as I said, we are number two or three in all Euro European rankings. And let's see which... Uh, other sectors we may have such a, a, a good ranking. I think communications are in a good situation. So regarding uh, digitalization, I think it's a very important challenge. There was a report published with almost 500 pages. Anacon has the results of the study that tries to identify what are the stumbling blocks for digitalization. Curiously, pricing is not uh, a problem. The availability of infrastructures and services is not a problem. Unfortunately, in 50% of the cases, the problem is the lack of interest for uh, digital literacy. There's a total lack of interest. So a lot is said about investments and the obligations of the operators. But we also have to start uh, speaking also about digital literacy, because that's also a very important topic. We have the infrastructures, we have the services and all that. But if the people are not uh, ready to use them, we can't do much. So the question of 5G must have had the involvement of everybody in the industry for this uh, to work in order to finish uh, this question of 5G. I would like to begin with you, Anna, in terms of the talent retention and the question of sustainability. These are two questions. 
and because we know that 5G spends some more energy. But to, on the other hand, we have the question of sustainability. How, uh, what is the situation? Where's the balance? And so how do we keep uh, and do we retain the talent? Well, I guess and, uh, without human talent uh, and without qualification, we cannot uh, um, evolve technologically in terms of the talent. And I think the Portugal and the world globally, because I live this in other geographies, uh, we are um, having a lack of uh, we have a lack of talent. Not difficult to attract it to our sector, but we do have difficulty in retaining it because now through the tools that exist, anybody here could work with, work remotely with other companies. I understand why Mary's colleagues want to meet in Portugal, because Portugal is a lovely place. And so once again, going back to competitiveness, in some matters, we're not competitive from the point of view of the work and uh, the tax, the taxes and the uh, taxation that we have means that because if we want to co compete in terms of wages, net wages, uh, or net salary, uh, what people take home we, uh, uh, in that area, we're not at all competitive. I think that Portugal has a lot of work to do. And so we have a lot of work in digital literacy. We must uh, improve the basic skills. We can't leave anybody behind. Obviously, we have to make an effort in school, but we have an older population, so we have to uh, get uh, the population to develop digital competences and not to be excluded, but we must develop advanced uh, skills as well. And I think that here uh, we have the work that has to be done with the academies in order to make uh, academies and universities to the needs of companies so that uh, we can have the necessary human resources for our companies in our sector can move forward. We've always uh, been and a company and a sector that's always known how to attract talent, but at the moment this is being sieged by other uh, companies that are a little uh, more se the sexier uh, because they grow, companies that grow and they can uh, um, evolve in terms of wages and, to, and activity, in terms of sustainability. 5G, I'm not an engineer, but 5G is uh, considered one of the tools in terms of sustainability is going to allow uh, to, to increase, enhance the features that we're talking about. And 5G is going to allow for logistic uh, chains to be improved and directly or indirectly is going to reduce energy consumption. Thank you very much. So can you sum up in order to answer the same question? Well, Anne has already mentioned, said, uh, I mean, it's not easy to uh, answer, add anything to what's always been said, but uh, uh, talent retention is a cross uh, cost cutting. And so uh, in the of Europe, Portugal, we have the question of our dimension. And from the moment remote work started, and today we have a lot of Portuguese working here for other companies and other geographies. And this uh, has decreased uh, uh, like that existed before. Uh, well, how, what do we do? This is difficult. We all have, first of all, we have to guarantee that employees are motivated, they have projects, that they enjoy the projects uh, they're carrying out because the, the financial part is not everything. It is important, but it's not everything. And so from this, we have teams that are very motivated with many challenges ahead. And so it's a great pleasure to work in a company like Vodafone. And so we feel this every day, and there's an inflation that is like to scarcity. So we, the companies, technological companies, we spend a lot of time in training because every year when we have a program, we have to come and get to people coming to our company. And so we, every three years, we must uh, uh, have a renewal in order to be truly informed and sustainability. It's a great effort and so sustainability in relation to consumption. Vodafone of Portugal 
We have renewable energies in our networks. 5G has, has uh, a potentially greater consumption of energy, and so that is the relevance of 5G to the area of the environment and is already talking about this. But we as an organization, from a theoretical point of view, that's what we do, but we're making an integral uh, improvement of the network to integrate 5G, but uh, our equipment, uh, I would say that the greatest surprise is the cost of energy, and so we Yeah, that is in terms of uh, consumption. There are tools that uh, will allow for an efficient use of the energy. That's an, an energy we're looking at. So, so t have you managed to retain talent uh, very quickly? Yes. We know that in the labour markets, you know, the labour markets are very dynamic, I think. This is a, a situation uh, that affects everybody. And so we pay uh, the employee for the same amount. Uh, in, another, in another country, he would uh, end up by taking money home because here we... Uh, oh, we... Uh, we work here have to pay taxes, and those who come, uh, those who come from abroad, uh, actually get uh, tax allowances. Uh, but now you're going to pay taxes here in terms of sustainability. I think it's the opposite. Five G. So uh, the value that I can bring can compensate this to the country. So five G is above all a driver of uh, uh, energy efficiency by taking intelligence to uh, millions of uh, machines. And these uh, um, machines are going to be more intelligent or smarter. And so 5G is going to be a great contribution. We have four and a half minutes from the end. And so I would like to begin with Mario Vaj about cybersecurity. How is Vodafone? Is everything fixed? We well, has the uh, an attack. Uh, so, what information do you have about what happened? Let's well, see. You asked the question, and gave us the answer. It is a, a secret, so I can't tell you any more. It's confidential. There was an attack. It wasn't an attack to Vodafone. It was a vehicle, so because who the who, those who were attacked with the whole all the Portuguese. And uh, because indirectly critical sectors were attacked, and this is another example of the more critical the sector is for the country, uh, the more attentive we have to be to this uh, issue. Are we prepared for the worst and also anticipating the fact that everything is going well, but uh, we know that the things can go uh, wrong. And so I'm not going to repeat myself because at the, at the time I said uh, this, but we have managed to uh, recover things at record time. And I would like to thank everybody and my colleagues uh, for the collaboration they gave right from the very uh, first moment. And so um, but there's uh, many I would like to uh, thank uh, all of those who wanted to help us. So from the point of view of clients, it's uh, resolved. But internally, we still have things to do. So there's a number of things that have to be recovered. So but, uh, but we're very close to reach our objective. But in terms of uh, clients, everything has been resolved. But um, it is um, um, the importance uh, uh, if there's something good and I practically find none. It, it, I hope nobody goes through uh, the experience that was the worst experience of my professional life was the attention that uh, everybody gave there were other companies in Portugal that were uh, uh, but didn't you have any sign or do you have any indication of the uh, author of this attack or authors of what the reason what I can is uh, I can draw from the consequences what the intentions were because it was destructive so as I said, we have no indication 
and the location. Well, if I knew, I couldn't tell you. But uh, the location, there's no geographies for cyber attacks. It's very easy to disguise the locations. It's under, inv it's under investigation. Very, very quickly. Nosh. Well, it was a lesson uh, for, for the other operators. They protected themselves with a lesson. The, th the threat, the risk uh, of cyber attacks existed before this very unfortunate incident, and it was uh, um, part of our core, part of our concerns. And so, what we understood is obviously this leads us to reinforce measures of protection, but we know that no company, no institution is 100% uh, um, covered, protected. So if it attacks one, it attacks all. And so, as I mentioned, as I said, nobody's free. Altis is ready for this. And then we all learned uh, with this. We all worked uh, in terms of uh, protection measures, mitigation measures, uh, and recovery measures, because it's important to recover. I'm of the same opinion as my colleagues, when a sector, in this case it was Vodafone, but it could have been anybody. And so when the sector is uh, the object of a cyber attack, it's against all of us. Uh, we are competitors. We obviously comp compete in innovation services, but we, uh, the three of us, are aligned in terms of fighting crime. No uh, company, no citizen, no state is uh, free from cyber attacks, and so we <coughs> have to work together. And so this could be a subject of national security. And uh, uh, once again, we think that in terms of the state of nation, that this sector, when there is a cyber attack, it is very irrelevant for the function. And so it could happen at the time that 5G was fully working. With everything this implies, it could have been much more complicated, as we know. Well, very quickly to, to conclude, and so I can give you can give you 40 seconds to each, and uh, I would like you to talk about the impacts of new country, a company in terms of costs and impacts for the client. Mm, that is the, with the economic and financial contracts that we're going through. Pandemic, um, war in Ukraine, inflation rate 10 percent, 7.2 in April in Portugal. Uh, interest rates are going to increase. We all know this. True. Well, we in Altis, we monitor all the evolution of the uh, context very closely. We have to identify what to. Uh, uh, the economic risks could, um, structural risks are that are going to affect us more significantly. We are monitoring it. We are beginning to feel the impacts the first quarter. We didn't feel so, the impact so much, but now they, we are going to feel these impacts until the end of the year. And so we can see how long this war uh, lasts. And so this is going to depend. Uh, but the impacts, uh, just for example, I think there was a declaration from Russia saying uh, that, that it declares uh, almost uh, that we could be on the, the eve of a uh, uh, nuclear war. It's a tornado, so we're feeling the impacts in terms of energy. And obviously, we're going to, to try and mitigate them in terms of reflective air clients. But we can't say that this is only a reflection. So because the, there's the lack of resources, the materials survive like There are several factors. Uh, there's inflation, raw materials. Obviously, the disruption of logistics chains also leads to increasing costs, not in production only, but also in transport. And we have a lack of talent and human resources. So at the end of the day, uh, we have all the elements for the perfect storm. But we have to be positive. We work in Altis to maintain our business and our balance resilience to any kind of impact. And we will monitor closely what we need to do. 
and we shall have the courage to make difficult decisions when we have to. We were not worried about inflation in the past, but now we have to be constantly monitoring this because uh, we're going to be impacted by it. Well, there was a problem in 1993. Yes, but that was then, this is now, and the levels of uncertainty are increasing. We don't know when the war is going to end in the Ukraine and how, when are we going to get back the resources that we were getting from there. There are so many uncertainties. We have to be constantly uh, seeking efficiencies to try to minimize the effects, uh, the negative impact for consumers. They are inevitable, of course, but we have to be prepared to confront them. We may have some delay, but we'll make it in the end. Are you feeling? Are you feeling this? Yeah, we're fe feeling some of the mm, delays that ex existed before the before the COVID uh, pandemic. But life goes on, and uh, this inflation is really affecting materials uh, as energy, the fuels. There's so many elements. We're trying to do our best to be in control of the situation. And of course, it's difficult to find efficiencies on top of uh, existing efficiencies. But we're working on it because from the the point uh, of wishful thinking, prices could come down, but it's not viable. And so we have to make the utmost efforts to uh, overcome the situation. I think everything has been said. You have both mentioned As a sector, we are uh, very much exposed in areas that have suffered uh, many disruptions. For instance, the electronics uh, crisis, and we're also subject to uh, inflation. And we're much exposed to the rising prices of electricity. So as an industry overall, we are particularly exposed to all these logistics disruptions that existed and will continue to exist. And we are particularly exposed to productive factors that have been suffering higher uh, price rises it's going to be difficult to manage the coming times. I know we've reflected a lot in recent months on these situations. Well, apart from these supply difficulties, we have other elements that we have to bear in mind. And there have been increasing, prices have increased um, by more than two digits in recent months because of the difficulties in supply. We pay expensive prices for electricity, you know, that uh, the electricity bills have more than doubled. This is lots of millions of euros and is going to have an impact on everyone and everybody. And of course, there will be repercussions. Our own collaborators are also suffering from inflation and they will have to do something about it. So generically speaking, I understand that our whole cost, our whole cost structure is suffering. Well, thank you very much uh, to this lady and to the two gen gentlemen for discussing the state of the nation of communications in Portugal. Thank you very much. Now we shall have the closing uh, speech by Rogério Carapuça, the president of APDC.